Hi, welcome to Wet Pixel Live. My name is Adam Hanlon. I'm the editor of Wet Pixel, and we'd like to thank Icolite for sponsoring this episode. Icolite do a wide range of housings, arms, and some wonderful strobes. Please check them out at icolite.com um, for to check out their full range. Um, I'm super happy to be joined by my regular contributor, or our regular contributor, Alex Mustard. Hi, Alex. Hi, Adam. Nice to see you. Good to see you too. Um, have you been diving at all? Yeah, yes, lots of diving, lots of underwater photography. Fantastic. Um only only here in the UK, but that's that's all right. I can I can I can put up with that. No, it's I've been really nice and quite you know, it's, it's amazing how much the temperature varies along the south coast of England. It's actually cooler the further west you go. Yeah. Um the more the influence of the Atlantic, the warmer it is in the winter, but the colder it is in the in the summer. Yeah. So yeah, it was kind of 14 in the shallows in in Cornwall. Yep. Um, and 18 yesterday in Dorset, wow. you know, just a day or so later. So, yeah. really, four degrees is a massive difference in water yeah. temperature. Yeah. Particularly in sea know. temperature, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Um, fantastic. Well, um, that, that sounds really good. Um, so, I thought that one of the things that we haven't spoken about great deal on Wet Pixel Live yet is um, fisheye lenses. And mm. I know. I was shooting one yesterday. I, and, and I know that Alex wrote a fantastic chapter on fisheye lenses in his book. There we are. That's the one. That's it. Yeah, that was that. Um, I was shooting the the um, eight to fifteen yesterday, um, and and actually in the UK I tend to use it behind a uh, behind a sl uh, kind of a medium sized dome port. Yeah. Whereas in the tropics I tend to use it behind a big dome port because the UK photography is more close focus, wide angle balanced. Yeah. Um, I also use this one, but um, on days when I need to change the lens a lot, I tend not to take it because it's more of a faff changing this over because it, because of the need to use a um the the insert for it yeah um, right so sorry just, Adam, just to explain to everyone that, 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 that second lens is what well, the, the two lenses that alex just told up first one was a nikon 8 to 15 um f3.5 to 4.5 and the second one was the nikonus rs i think, I think it's f oh, yeah, you're right it's f3.5 to 4.5 mine is actually taped up if you don't know if you can see it's taped so yeah. it cannot be zoomed there you it's go taped fixed at 15 it not only do i not put a zoom ring on it i actually tape it at 15 because so you can't move something yeah, so else it's, it's 8 to 15 taped up at 15 at 15 we, we something else it's worth mentioning and, and uh, correct me if i'm wrong here alex but you normally leave the um the petal um uh hood on it don't you the, the... yes it, it flares definitely flares with if you don't leave the hood on however when i use the small domes here in the uk i take the hood off Ah, which is why the hood is not taped on. Yeah. Um, so the hood will come off. So, and, and I would like to leave it on, but the problem is, is that to make it a really good close focus wide angle beast with the lens that I use, I have it nice and quite close to the dome, which is not perfect optically, but I can assure you in British waters with the fisheye, that's a, a compromise well worth making. Yeah. And then I can, yeah, then it becomes a really nice close focus wide angle. And I use it with the Zen 170 dome, yeah. which is, is, is kind of a, a smaller section of a big dome yeah so um but yeah it works very nicely like that i'm very happy with that setup i think i think it may be worth we, we've gone down this rabbit hole alex you've you've dragged us down it so i think we're going to keep going down it so 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 obviously the reason why alex is suggesting that that close focus wide angle is very much a feature for uk photography is that we tend to have limited visibility and in limited visibility it makes getting closer to your subject is always going to be advantageous am i right in saying that alex is that is yeah, that and, and that really it? is, you know, the you know the the reason why we love fisheye lenses in underwater photography is we don't want the distortion that they bring, yeah. but in reality the distortion that they have and they create a a barrel distortion, so a straight line at the bottom of the frame bows up, a straight line at the top of the frame bows down. Yeah. Um. But underwater we don't have a lot of straight lines, and and really most of the time that distortion is is, is not a problem. Yeah. Um, the reason that they work, we, we love them as underwater photographers is that distortion is not an issue, really. And they are the lenses that allow us to shoot as big a scene as possible from as close as possible, yeah. which makes the visibility look better. We can we can deal with bigger subjects. Um, we can create impact. And, and for those reasons, you know, they're the best lenses to use. So as long as you know you can get close to your subject, if it's a wide angle scene, your almost default choice is nearly always fisheye. Yep. Because you you can get in close and and I would say I do eighty percent plus of my wide angle photography with fisheye. Yeah, um, yep. I mean you know because I I like shooting those sort of scenes with fisheye. Anyway, um, I know you've got you got me distracted. Do you want me to 
actually talk a bit more about the basics. Yes, got it. Let's let's. let's so so Alex's book um, has a fantastic um, sub uh, chapter on fish eye lenses. So go on, uh, Alex. I think chapter's a bit generous, but it's got a section. A section, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Um, but no, it's it's quite good because I think you know here I've gathered my thoughts a bit better than I've managed today. But it goes fish eye lenses. The fish eye lens is as essential to underwater photography as water is to life on Earth. I'm, a little bit of hyperbole there. <laughs> I, think, I think it's really important with new underwater photographers. Yeah. to make them realize how important they are. Because a lot of people, they're scared by fish eyes. Yeah. They find them hard to use. Yeah. And people go to tighter lenses because they're easier to use. Yeah. But they're not as powerful. And, and forcing yourself to learn a fish eye. So the reason for that hyperbole in the book is to force people to go, these are the lenses you need to be using. And yeah. don't muck that, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then, um, what else do I say? Um, they're the widest lenses available, typically seeing 180 degrees corner to corner. Um, making them unrivaled when it comes to shooting the biggest scenes through as little water as possible. Um, their real party piece, though, is close focus wide angle. See page 60 for anyone following. <laughs> <on>. uh, <laughs> classically described by Brian Skerry and Howard Hall as the most beautiful type of photograph that can be made underwater. Photographers can be intimidated by fish eyes because they are considered difficult to light. This well, this problem comes from the very wide view and from being so close to the subject. So the reason that it's difficult to light fish eyes is they see really, really wide. So you've yep. got a lot to light up. Yep. And the fact that you have to, to get the impact on them, you need to be close to your subject. Yep. And both those things, trying to light a wide scene and being close to your subject, make lighting difficult. Yep. And that's really where people struggle with fish eyes. Yeah. I think the, the key thing when you learn to use a fisheye is make is the first problem is learn to get close enough. Yeah. If you don't, you end up with photos that are backgrounds, yeah. not photographs. They, you know, you end up shooting backgrounds if you don't get close. So you need a prime subject when you shoot a fisheye picture to place front and center to dominate the picture. Yeah. Then you need to work hard on your lighting. Yep. Um, to get the lighting right. And if you don't have your strobes in the right position with fish eyes, if you don't have the powers right on the two strobes to get that lighting quality, your fish eye shots will be disappointing. So they require that. However, with practice, those solutions are pretty consistent time and time again. Yep. And so once you've learned that knack of shooting the fish eye shot, yep. I, you know, I think it says in the book, it would say, um, Mastering a fisheye is the biggest watershed moment in the development of most underwater photographers. You know, it, it's, it's when you get on top of that, suddenly you go from really struggling to produce good pictures to being able to produce good pictures of almost anything you see all the time. Yeah, yeah. And so there, it's really a, a critical thing. It, to get it becomes very repeatable, doesn't it? It's the kind of thing. It's mm. almost, almost, almost formulaic. Not quite, because but once, once, once you've got you figured out how to do it, you can repeat it um, almost at will. And that, that's a. I mean, that it can be. I mean, it's a great tool to have that because you know if you're going to go somewhere and you need to get a shot, you stick the fish eye on get the lighting right, bang, you've got the shot. And then you can start experimenting with all the, the weird and wonderful things that, that come later on. Um, I, so so you, the people may or may not be aware, we've we just run a, 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 a cenote workshop in Mexico. Um, and I was meant to be there last week, obviously couldn't um, be there. So so we were running in image reviews on Zoom, which was a whole new ball game. It's like I've never done before. Um, but, but, and actually I had to say, Two things. First of all, it was fantastic to see all this wonderful imagery that the participants were producing. So, so even though I was thousands of miles away, I felt quite involved in the workshop, which was wonderful, and and seeing the results, um, and that was very inspiring and very, very um, actually very motivating as well. Um, but secondly, of course, it gave me some. And one of the interesting things I noticed is the caves. I've always tended to shoot rectilinear in in caves simply because stalactite might start types grow straight up and down but they went to angelita which is the cave with the massive hydrogen sulfide cloud with the with the trees growing through it obviously not growing but but merging through it and and a couple of the guys were shooting fisheye in there and i have to say the results were amazing they were beautiful and that was purely down to the fact that you've got this 180 degree full of view it's a big scene they managed to get it lit up which is takes some doing and they manage to get these incredible images. So, so there are occasions when simply just having that massive field of view. Now, one of the images interestingly had bubbles in it and the bubbles were curved and that I didn't like that, but then 
I guess there is something you could do about curve bubbles. You could take them out. But in general, in, yeah, I would agree. But in general, you know, you've got you've got um, you know, if you've got a really really big scene that you want to capture, the fish eye can do that too. Um, but then obviously you're not trying to light a specific subject. So it was an interesting use of fish eye, and not one that I'd really considered before either. It's a bit different, really. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think it's probably there's two other points I'd like to make as we wrap up. Um, the first one is the times maybe not to use a fisheye, which I think is important to understand. Um, a, the majority of fisheyes, and I know one of the most popular doesn't bend this rules, um, are stuck at this 180 super wide view. And if you know you're not able to get close enough to your subjects to really fill the frame with them, a fisheye is going to create very disappointing shots where everything mm. seems to be in the background. Yep. Um, I know that the Takina 10 to 17, which is one of the most popular fish eyes around, does give you that zoom capability, which makes it an almost perfect underwater lens um, that allows you, if you can't quite get close enough, to be able to zoom in and, and get a bit more magnification. But generally, fish eyes, you know, if you're on a big animal dive and you're not sure maybe that you're going to be able to get that close, they're not the right lens. Mm. Um, but I think the main time we go away from fish eyes is when we really don't want that distortion look. Yep. And going into environments where we don't want bendiness. Um, you mentioned caves inside of wrecks. Yep. Um, and also, I think that um, people photography is often best done without fisheye lenses. It does depend a bit on the types of shots you're doing. Um, yep. A lot of diver photography works well on fisheye, but yep. actual people photography, you know, swimming pool models or in the sea with models, those pictures are often better without a fisheye because the the fisheye is not the most flattering lens to photograph a, a person who... Really... They're great for comedic effect, but yeah. <laughs> not necessarily for beauty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite often on workshops, people do, you know, photos of everyone on board with a fisheye right in their face, which is yeah. always always quite a nice look too. <laughs> um, I think the other thing I would say just on, on the lens choice is there are certain photographers who deviate away from fisheye and, and one, you know, who, and although I think the fisheye is the best lens to use underwater, one person whose work who doesn't use fisheye much is Brian Skerry. Yeah. And, you know, he's got you know, phenomenal images. And I know these days he's using the WACP more. Yeah. But for a long time, a large amount of his photography was done on rectilinear wide angle rather than fisheye. Yeah. And I think it's because he fe felt that with the National Geographic audience, you know, an audience of non-divers, who he's predominantly shooting for, um, he felt that he wanted a more correct look for the underwater world. Yeah. I, I also think that we as underwater photographers, we, we become, we're very accustomed to the look of fisheye shots mm. and find them very normal. Mm. I think when land photographers judge our work, yeah. they often don't like that look. And yeah. if you look, for example, at the history of the underwater pictures awarded in the Wildlife Photographer of the Year, you will see lots more of them taken with non fisheye wide angles than yep. fisheye lenses. Yep. Yet you can bet that far more fisheye shots were entered. Yep. So there's definitely, you know, in, in some genres, some areas, maybe the fisheye isn't the right tool. I think, I think um, the fisheye is very graphic, isn't it? It produces a mm. gra very graphic image, whereas the, the rectilinear will tend to produce a more documentary image. I mean, obviously, the, whenever you say something yeah. like that, you'll be by definition wrong. No, but, but I, I but really like that. I think that's a great uh, way. Um, you know, there's, there's, you know the, those very distorted curved images that we were joking about of each other on the dive boat post-dive, you know, they are a very graphic image. They're, they're bizarre and strange mm. and fun. Um, and obviously, um, whereas if you shot that same picture with a rectilinear, it would just look like a portrait. So so that's kind of the difference, isn't it? Um, yeah. 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 And, and then the other point that I think it's really important to make is the confusion that people have over fish eyes and focal lengths. Mm. Um, and, you know, a lot of the time, for example, with the 10 to 17 fish eye, yeah. people say, why do I need a 10 to 17 fish eye? I already have a 10 to 24 or a 10 to 22 wide angle zoom. Yeah. Surely they're the same. And yeah. yes, they are the same focal lengths, but they are not the same field of view. Yeah. And it's the field of view that matters for how wide your lens sees. And I think the best way I, I will explain it to people is to say, yes, they are the same denomination, the same number, but those are different currencies. Yeah. The relationship between focal length of a fisheye lens and its field of view is different to every other lens and its field of view. You know, think of one being dollars, all the normal lenses are in dollars and fisheyes are in pounds yeah. um, for, or euros or, or whatever. 
Um, and so you need to understand the field of view to really understand what those lenses are doing. And I think that's a common area that people get tripped up on is they don't see the point of a fisheye because it seems the same focal length as the other lenses they have. But in reality, this is the lens that gives you the ultra wide view. And that is power in underwater photography. Yeah. And, and as you said, the ability, therefore, to get closer, which is back to where we started mm -hmm. from. So, yeah, yeah, perfect. Um, I think that's a, that's a wonderful synopsis of, um, of fish eyes. Um, yeah, there, there was one other point I was going to make, sorry, which we, we did sort of start with, but I didn't really maybe explain. And that is, I think the other reason we like fish eyes underwater is that they are forgiving uh, yeah. to use with dome ports. Yeah. And maybe you're about to say that. In, in, oh, in I was about to ask you about dome ports, Alex. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, <laughs> and I think that also makes them, you know, very popular in underwater photography. And I don't think we need to expand too much on that, but I think they're easier to use with dome ports. You can get away often with using a smaller dome port with a fisheye. Um, and if you don't quite get your settings right, they still produce very forgiving images. Yep. So, yeah, that's that's also another boon for us. Yep, yep, yep. It saves us from dragging around very large dome ports and so on, to keeping having to maintain very uh, very closed apertures. Um, fantastic. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, you mentioned your book. Is it where can we get the book? Um, it's it, it's still quite widely available. Um, Underwater Photography Masterclass. It's in there's a Chinese language edition, a Korean language edition. There's um, Kindle versions. There's iBook versions. The iBook version is a very nice yeah, electronic yeah, version because it's got videos in it as well. Yep, um, yep. And and both the electronic versions have a, the same text, but a lot more pictures because I wasn't limited by page space. So that yep. um, and quite a lot of people I know do own both. They have the paper book because they actually prefer the paper book at home. Yeah. And then they have the electronic book with a bit of extra content, you know, for travel. And yeah, I like the, I was gonna say I like the electronic book for travel, and I, and I often read it on the airplane on, on the way over just to kind of get my head back in the in the right space. So yeah, yeah. I, I don't have an iPad, so I don't have a copy of it. So. <laughs> I'll lend you mine next time, Alex. Um, <laughs> fantastic. Um, so um, thank you again, um, and thanks to iClight again for sponsoring this episode. Our, our sponsor support is is really crucial, so we thank them very much. Um, I'd like to thank you all for watching. Please feel free to add any comments about your experience using fish eyes in the comment section below, and drop us a like if you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you again soon.